الرحيم اهلا بحضراتكم آه نبدا آه آه وقائع الويبينار الثاني آه في سلسله الويبينارز اللي بتنظمها جمعيه القلب المصريه آه بالتعاون مع اي هارت وشركه ماركيل احنا الحقيقه بنشكرهم على ذير آه سبورت زي ما قلنا امبارح آه للي حضر معانا احنا الويبينارز دي they are based uh, on this um, paper, a position statement from the Egyptian Society of Cardiology that's uh, meant to be a guide, uh, a rapid guide actually, uh, to the management of cardiac patients uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic in Egypt. Uh, and, and during uh, this pandemic and non-communicable diseases, cardiac patients, Uh, they are at higher risk uh, for cardiovascular uh, and for mortality uh, during this COVID infection. On the other hand, they don't take their proper service. In this uh, statement, to make a balance uh, between how to uh, give these patients the proper care that they deserve, like STEMI patients, like heart failure patients, and at the same time, Uh, stop the spread of infection and protect the medical staff and protect other patients from getting this pandemic and this infection, which is a, a severe infection, as we all know. So this is the, the, the balance that we are uh, trying to concentrate uh, 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 on these uh, webinars. Um, we have a lot of uh, eminent uh, speakers uh, from Egypt and from abroad. Uh, uh, most of them are uh, Egyptian uh, doctors, cardiologists uh, living abroad, and we are very proud to uh, have them and to accept our invitation and to be part of these uh, webinars. Few men who live in Inglaterra, few men who live in America, few men who live in Almania, live in the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. وحي كمان هيشرفنا بروفيسور شتيفان اخنباخ اللي هو البريزنت الكت اوف ذا يوروبين سايت اوف كارديولوجي ومعانا البروفيسور محمد عوض تاج الدين مستشار رئيس الجمهوريه هيكلمنا عن هاو تو ديل وذ ذيس بانديميك فروم ذا تشيست بوينت اوف يو ومعانا طبعا الحقيقه ايجيبشن مودريتورز على اعلى مستوى عشان يتحاوروا مع الساده المتحدثين خلينا نقول ان this webinar, uh, the second webinar, uh, we will have two eminent speakers. Uh, 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 the first uh, lecture is given by Professor Haysam Suleiman Gharib about infection control and uh, uh, personal protective equipments in COVID-19 pandemic. الحقيقة ان دي برضو كانت احد مبادرات جمعية القلب المصرية وشعبة الوقاية برئاسة الدكتورة أستاذ الدكتورة جميلة. على انهم يزودوا الوعي في موضوع الانفكشن كنترول بالذات الميديكال ستاف ازاي تو بروتكت هيم سيلف اند هيز كوليجز فروم انفكشن اند وي نو ذات ذيس از فيري امبورتنت واحنا ما كناش نعرف عنه كتير لكن اتعلمنا في الايام اللي فاتت حاجات يعني بسيطه نتمنى ان دكتور هيثم ان شاء الله يزود معلوماتنا عنها المحاضره الثانيه ذا سكند ليكشر ويل بي جيفن باي دكتور حاتم سليمان اند ذا بي اوت Uh, lung ultrasound. This is a very new topic. كتير مننا كارديولوجيست ما ما سمعناش عنه وأنا واحد من. It seems that this is a new trend that will be evolving uh, nowadays. A non-invasive technique that can be useful uh, among COVID-19 patients. لينا أرحب بالمودريتورز النهاردة عندنا الحياة بروفيسور جميلة ناس. بروفيسور جميلة الحياة. is a very active member in the Egyptian Society of Cardiology. She's the Secretary General of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology. And Taban, she's originally Professor of Cardiology in the Suez Canal uh, University. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. فنتمنى ان شاء الله انه يحصلنا وعلى راس قائمه الضيوف طبعا الاستاذنا الفاضل العظيم الدكتور محفوظ الشهاب از ايجيبشن باي اوريجن اند هي ستيل ا فيري جود فريند تو ذا ايجيبشن سوسايتي اوف كارديولوجي 
uh, and uh, he's offering us a lot of support. He is actually the president of the International Society of Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and a clinical professor of medicine, uh, universities of Florida and South Florida and the medical director of Cardiovascular Health Assessment Center and president uh, in uh, Sarasota, Florida, USA. So uh, welcome, Professor uh, Mahfouz. Uh, just a, a short comment on uh, our uh, speakers. Uh, Professor Haistam Suleiman Gharib is actually a lecturer of cardiovascular medicine in uh, cardiology department in Fayoum University uh, with, a, uh, uh, with a strong uh, CV. He's a professional member uh, of, of the European Society of Cardiology and a member of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology and the Egyptian Hypertension Society. But Sharraf Bogudak Maana, Dr. Haysam, Wahanis Mamena Kinshallah Hadrahoya, would do if Laziz Ali Alena, Dr. Hatim Siliman. Hatim Haya is a graduate of the Alexandria University. He, uh, he has uh, his uh, MBCHB in uh, December 2003. Then he got his master's degree in critical medicine from Alexandria University in 2008. Then he was uh, offered the membership of the Royal College of Physicians, uh, UK, in 2014. And he got the National Board of Echocardiography from the USA. And uh, he uh, also got a postgraduate diploma in cardiology from London, UK, um, and uh, a European Site of Intensive Medicine uh, 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 in 2017. And uh, I think, again, uh, he has got the master's degree in clinical education. What a strong CV, Dr. Alambik, Alambik, of webinar. Um, so this was my uh, introduction. I would like to uh, give the mic now to uh, Professor Gamila to introduce the first speaker and start moderating uh, the first part of this. Part. Professor Gamil. <coughs> يعني دايما انت فكرك بيبقى متطور وكرييتف دايما فالحقيقه انا بسجل ان حضرتك صاحب الفكره حضرتك اللي كتبت ستارت تجميع الداتا وكتابه البوزيشن ستيتمنت بتاع الايجيبشن سوسايتي اوف كارديولوجي ان ذا بانديميك اوف اوف كوفيد 19 فانا بشكر حضرتك جدا على المجهود الكبير والفكر العالي جدا ان احنا دايما الجمعيه المصريه لامراض القلب تكون اهد دايما الجمعيه المصريه لامراض القلب بتكون يعني ليها ليها امباكت مجتمعي مهم مش لاطباء القلب لكل الاطباء في مصر يعني انا سعيده جدا ان انا تشير والله تشير في الـ في الـ في الويبينار الرائع ده سعيدة جدا 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 بوجود الأستاذي الدكتور محفوظ الشهاوي لأنه أستاذ الدكتور محفوظ الشهاوي لما بنتكلم we are all proud of him يعني we are all proud أن يكون مصري يكون the president of the International Society of Cardiovascular Disease Prevention and that's an amazing أن إحنا دايما بيبقى سعداء بوجوده منتمي إلى مصر بشكل مذهل دايما بيساعدنا دايما معانا فاحنا بندعو له دايما بالصحه والعافيه واحنا وي ار براود سير ان احنا وي هاف ان ا ليدر اوف بريفنشن اول اوفر ذا وورلد معانا مصري بيساعد مصر رفع رفع اسم مصر في كل مكان فاحنا بنرحب بحضرتك جدا وبنشكرك. ثانك يو فيري ماتش بروفيسور جميله. طبعا سعيده جدا بوجود الدكتور حاتم سليمان. واحنا بنشكره جدا a very strong CV زي ما قال الدكتور سامح انما ابننا العزيز الدكتور هيثم سليمان غريب الدكتور هيثم سليمان غريب اللي انا هنبتدي السيشن دلوقتي على توبيك مهم قوي طبعا احنا بنتكلم على في الايرا اوف كوفيد 19 الحقيقه احنا ملاحظين ان يعني في برضو عدد كبير جدا من الهيلث كير بروفيشنالز عندهم مشاكل كبيره جدا ان هو هاو تو بروتكت 
ده قد يكون لان هو يعني قصه الانفكشن كنترول شود بي كونسيدر بقوه الستبس الدافنج الدونج والدافنج ده برضه هيكلمنا عليها الدكتور هيثم سليمان غريب الانفكشن كنترول ده 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 جزء لا يتجزا من البريفنشن في في الايرا اوف كوفيد 19 هو الحقيقه انا شايفه ان هو وان اوف ذا يعني الاوتموست امبورتنس في الايرا بتاعت كوفيد 19 فالدكتور هيثم الحقيقه انا قبل ما يبتدي محاضرته انا بحب اشكره جدا لان الدكتور هيثم سليمان غريب مدرس القلب جامعه الفيوم الحقيقه هو قبل ما ي... الفترة اللي فاتت دي بذل مجهود كبير جدا سجل فيديوهات للجمعية المصرية لأمراض القلب آه وسجل ل... 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 زي إن ال... 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 الهيلث كير بروفيشنال ب... ي... يعني يبقى ليه القدرة على إنه يحمي نفسه ويحمي نفسه دي حاجة مهمة جدا لأن زي ما احنا بنقول الأطباء هم خط الدفاع الأول دلوقتي فلازم يحمي نفسه لأنه هو بيحمي الوطن وهو أمن الوطن الصحي دكتور هيثم اتفضل حضرتك هتدينا برزنتيشن على الانفكشن كنترول وعلى البرسونال بروتكتف اكويبمنتس وإحنا أكيد أنا عارفة أن دي حقيقة محاضرة هتكون في منتهى الأهمية Thank you, Dr. Ramila, for uh, your compliments. Uh, um, and um, the aim of يعني دكتور هيثم انا عارفه انا هقول سر يمكن للابناء كلهم ان هو ماشي بالبروتكتف ميجرز معاه في العربيه بتاعته فكل آه. حد بيقدر يعلم الناس يعمل فيديوهات في كل مكان اي نو ان هو بيعمل كده فانا بشكرك فابتدي بقى ستارت يور برزنتيشن. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, the aim of, um, of dealing with an infection control and PPE is not only to protect ourselves or protect the patient, but also to protect the medical environment uh, that we are living in or dealing with, uh, starting from the ambulance till uh, dealing with any patient in a complex or a, a, um, or a conventional procedure. So it's not only uh, the protection of ourselves or a protection of the patient or isolation of the patient, but it's um, a whole system. And uh, as Professor Samah uh, elegantly said, that uh, the information we are discussing will be based upon the rapid guide, the position paper of the Egyptian Society of Cardiology and uh, the European Society of Cardiology guidance uh that has nearly the same informations so there are concepts of pandemic these concepts must be uh, memorized must be a guidance and must not be broken first one is there is no emergency in pandemic yes the life of our patients uh, is the aim uh, of of our lives is to preserve the life of our patients, but in order to do so, we must preserve our lives. So there is nothing called that I break the chain of protection in an emergency. There is no emergency in pandemic. If you're not protected, if you do not have your full PPE, do not engage in any emergency because you will endanger your life and the life of the patient and the life of the expected patients that you can serve. So this is one. The second one is that safety of the healthcare professional is a priority. The third, that patient protection against infection is a must. Patients either are COVID uh, positive patients or non-COVID positive patients. So we must protect our patients in order not to have a cross infection. Otherwise, we will have a large petri dish uh, or culture and not a hospital. So we must provide a clean track and a safe track for patients that are not uh, uh, COVID infected or suspected. And another track 
for patients who are suspected, expected to be COVID or COVID positive. Last one, that urgent procedures only. There is no place for uh, elective procedures in the time of pandemic because this will increase the rate of infection. So what are the types of patients that are we're dealing with now? Are there a negative patient, a probable case or a suspected case, or a positive case? What's a positive or a confirmed case? This is a person who is a laboratory confirmed of a COVID infection irrespective of the clinical signs or symptoms. The probable cases are those with a suspicion of whom testing of COVID SARS virus is inconclusive or a suspected case for whom testing could not be performed for any reason. A suspected case is a patient with fever or symptoms and signs of COVID and a history of travel to any pandemic area in the last 14 days. Or a patient with symptoms suggestive of COVID and having been in contact with a confirmed COVID patient in the last 14 days, or a patient with severe symptoms requiring hospitalization in the absence of any alternative diagnosis that can uh, explain his symptoms. The negative patients are the patient with a negative test, PCR test for the COVID-19, or a suspected case with two negative swaps or a recovered case with multiple negative swaps uh, as a recovered COVID case, uh, of course. So what are the levels of personal protective equipment? And do we need to wear one level or, or one set of equipment in all uh, our situations or not? No, we have levels varying from zero to four according to the degree of coverage of our body and the level of protection of our personal prote uh, protected equipment provided. So starting from zero, which is only the surgical mask, to level one, surgical mask, ga uh, uh, glove and the Macintosh, Th then we are increasing this with uh, a long sleeve gown uh, before the Macintosh, and in level three and four, we are expecting to deal with an aerosol uh, generating procedure. So we must have a face shield and a respirator mask, which have a higher filtration rate than the surgical mask. These are the uh, personal protective equipments in the circulating staff, the FFP2 mask, uh, nitrogen gloves, head cap, uh, gown, if fluid impermeable, and splash goggle. <clears throat> and if we're gonna do an invasive procedure, this uh, equipment must be uh, improved. So, this is a very, very important step. And this step uh, is the cause of protection for uh, most of us, and unfortunately, for infection of some of us is not to memorize and to do the donning, which is putting the personal protective equipment in the right way and not doing the doffing, which is undo the uh, personal protective equipment in the right way. The golden rule is the first thing you put in is the last thing you put out. So let's revise the donning. The donning First of all, we must uh, have the work clothes and not our personal clothes, like a, a scrub or something. Then wash your hands and sanitize your hand. Then put on a disposable surgical cap. Then put a medical protective mask, an N95 or higher, and perform uh, the, te the fitting test in order to be sure that this mask is not uh, 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 liked or there is no air passing behind the mask. Then put an inner disposable glove. Then put uh, your goggles and the protective clothes, which is either a jumpsuit or a long sleeve gown, 
according to the uh, situation you're dealing with then put another pair of disposable gloves the hood of the protective uh, uh, equipment or the cover all and then you're ready again put on the work clothes wash your hands put on a disposable surgical cap put your mask and perform a fitting test in, uh, for your mask put the uh, inner gloves then put the outer uh, cover all uh, layer which is impermeable and your goggles or the face shield then put the last layer of uh, glove and then you're ready the most important step after you finish is the doffing how we can do this first we must replace the outer glove with a new one then perform hygiene of this glove then remove the protective clothing which is the cover all first after that sterilize your glove another time then remove your goggles sterilize your glove uh, another time remove your mask sterilize your hands after putting out the glove and putting in another uh, 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 new glove remove the cap then remove the inner glove and then sanitize your hands and you're ready it's a little bit complicated but you must memorize it and you must have a chart uh, in the place you're taking your clothes out and in the place you're donning your clothes to remember all these steps so again replace the outer gloves with a new one sanitize your gloves take uh, take the outer protective layer which is the cover all sanitize your glove take the goggles sanitize your glove remove the mask away from your, your face sanitize your glove remove the cap then remove the inner layer perform hand hygiene and you're set to go so which for which which protective level is suitable for which situation so the level one protection is a disposable surgical cap a surgical mask the work uniform and latex, latex gloves this is applicable when i have a pre-examination triage or out, uh, outpatient department with a non-suspected SARS-CoV-2 patient. So I think in our current situation, we can all forget about the level one protection because we don't have now a patient that is 100% sure is a COVID negative. So we can forget about this level one protection. Level two protection is a disposable surgical cap, a medical protection mask, N95, FFP2 or higher, work uniform, a long sleeve gown, disposable surgical glove, and goggles. These are the standards when dealing with any patient suspected or expected to be a SARS-CoV-2 and outpatient department now in the isolation ward in which there is no aerosol generating procedure when performing a TEE and when cleaning the surgical or diagnostic inst instruments. The third level is again a disposable surgical cap and a higher medical mask with the FFP3, a work uniform, long sleeve gown, disposable surgical glove, a full face respirator protective if I'm going to do an aerosol generating procedure. Mind you, that now this is the european uh, recommendation but we have con uh, concerns about this recommendation because te and cleaning surgical and diagnostic instrument are considered now an aerosol generating procedure so when performing te to any patient or when cleaning the surgical uh, equipment i think we must uh, have a level three protection and not uh, level two protection 
What's the difference between these numbers? The surgical mask, the FFP2, the FFP3, the N95 mask, or the power air purifying respirator? It's all about the filtration power of uh, the mask I'm wearing. The surgical mask have a filtration power of 2 micron. The N95 and the FFP2 have a filtration power of 0.3 micron. And the FFP3 have a filtration power of 0.023 micron. Mind you, that the personal uh, contact lenses and the personal eyeglasses are not considered adequate eye protection. Some of the healthcare professionals consider uh, them protected, themselves protected when they are wearing their personal eyeglasses. This is not a protection and any particles can travel through uh, or around these uh, glasses and infect you. Another critique was done for the uh, European recommendation stating that in Italy and in China, they are using a more uh, uh, another layer of protection with a shoe cover, which must be uh, applic uh, applied because the rate of uh, uh, healthcare professional infection in China in particular is low comparing uh, the other countries. And they are stated that when, when talking about uh, um, the cost effectiveness, the cost effectiveness of the uh, medical staff absence is more than the cost of the personal PPE. Another thing in the infection control is that we must taught, uh, uh, teach the patient and teach the healthcare professional about the symptoms. And anyone that has fever, cough, shortness of breath, sore throat, anosmia, which is a very, very specific and very, very diagnostic symptom, muscle ache, nausea, diarrhea, must report these symptoms immediately and must perform, perform home isolation till he's sure that he's COVID positive or COVID negative. Another thing, the level of protection, the emphasization of the hand hygiene, the health the care professional treatment must be uh, a routine. So, now we've learned about how to protect ourselves. We will learn now how to protect the medical environment or the medical facility. It all starts with the ambulance. Inside the ambulance, the paramedics should wear a level two or three protection and not less than that. And while they are assessing the patient, the patient must have a surgical mask. At any doubt, this patient will be marked as a COVID probable, suspected or COVID positive uh, patient and must have a separate track inside the hospital uh, from the moment he's touching the triage or that this patient is a safe patient, he will have a clean uh, pathway uh, in order not to mingle with a COVID positive patient and get infected. In the ER, the clean patient or the patient with a negative COVID, uh, COVID suspicion will be dealt with in uh, a separate compartment. If he is suspected and stable and did not have a swap and, is, and the, this patient is complaining about a cardiac complaint, it's wise to have a phone uh, consultation with the cardiologist on board uh, before uh, this cardiology, uh, cardiologist physically examined the patient in order to determine whether this patient is urgent. The cardiologist need to examine him before uh, the swap or before the initial evaluation or this is a stable patient. He can do a CT scan. He can do a swap according to the hospital policy before being examined uh, uh, with a cardiologist. If this patient is unstable, please wear a level uh, uh, two or three uh, personal protective equipment uh, before examining this patient and consider this patient at any moment an unstable patient that can generate uh, aerosols. What about the words? It goes without saying that the negative 
patient will be held in a clean ward. If he's suspected, he must be isolated in a single or double room according to the uh, resources. And while we're doing he uh, him investigations, we must deal with him with a level two PPE. We must perform, perform him a swap. It's preferable that every patient have a, his own set of diagnostic equipment uh, uh, beside him. If there is a shortage of equipment, please clean these equipments thoroughly between patients. If the patient is positive, he will be isolated. If this patient is negative, but we are still in doubt, we must perform a chest CT, endotracheal aspirate, or another swab to make sure that this patient is either positive and he will be isolated or negative and he will be transferred to the clean ward. In the ICU, we don't have much choices, either an uncovered patient that must be dealt with in a separate part of the department with a separate health care professional who do not examine COVID patients or suspected COVID patients inside the uh, ICU. So inside the ICU, we, we need two teams, one dealing with uh, an uncovered patients and the other is dealing with uh, COVID positive patients without intermingling between the both um, teams. Any COVID patient in the ICU must be dealt with with a level three PPE. An example is what we can do uh, when entering uh, the cath lab. Outside the cath lab, we will put on the lead apron, perform a hand hygiene, take an FFP2 or a N95 mask, goggle or a face shield, surgical cap. We perform a second uh, hand washing. Then we do put the first pair of gloves and the gown. Inside the lab before the cast, a second pair of sterile gloves must be put in. Inside the cast lab, after the cast, remove the gown, peel it without any tear or any vigorous movement, and peel it from outside to the inside in order to have the inside of the gown uh, to the outside. So you're always touching the inside of the gown and not the outside and discard it uh, with care with the outer uh, gloves as one unit. And this is extremely important to, uh, to undo the gown and the outer pair of gloves as one unit. Outside the cath lab, we will dove the equipment as uh, with the said, perform the hand hygiene first, remove the cap, peel the second pair of gloves, wash your hands, have another pair of gloves if you are doubt that the splash goggles are infected, then remove the splash goggles, perform hand hygiene, remove the, the mask, uh, and then wash your hands again, and you're good to go. Another important point inside the cath lab is to control the airflow inside the cath lab. The majority of the cath labs all over the world do not have a negative uh, uh, suction or negative pressure system. In, ex in exchange, we must know from the uh, medical bioengineering what's the air exchange time inside the cath lab, which is the, uh, the time of the air spending from, from the source till the exit or the air duct. This air exchange time should be 30 times per hour and the minimum is 15 times per hour. Again, imagine the cath lab as a tunnel. The air is entering from only one direction and is out from another direction, the opposite direction. This call the air exchange time. This air exchange time must be ideally 30 times per hour and minimally 15 times per hour in order to perform any procedure with a COVID suspected or COVID positive patients inside the cath lab.
Again, there is no elective patients. Level 3 PPE must be aware because in the cath lab, any emergency could happen and you, you will need to resuscitate the patient or intubate the patient and all these procedures are aerosol uh, generating procedures. So from the start, a level 3 PPE is advisable. When you do a bag breathing to a patient inside the cath lab or out in order to decrease the contamination, have a ventilator filter uh, between the mask of the patient and the breathing bag in order to decrease the dissemination of the virus into the environment of the cath lab. And lastly, consider doing some procedures bedside and not inside the cath lab, like swan gan, catheter placement, pericardium pieces, and intraortic balloon counter pulsation insertion. These uh, procedure could be, procedures could be done as a bedside in order not to decrease the contamination of our cath labs. Lastly, our patients, our cardiac patients are extremely vulnerable patients. Most of them are old. Most of them have multiple comorbidities. And most of them, the infection uh, with a COVID-19 could be fatal. So please, please teach your patient to keep the mask uh, at every time and any time teach the patient about uh, the symptoms that could suggest uh, COVID-19 infection teach your patient about the right hygiene and the social distancing and again and again keeping masks at all time decrease the hospital stay of your patient as much as you can and consider now the telemedicine in the follow-up visits uh, for your patient. It will save time and it will save lives by decreasing the chance of contamination and cross-infection. Thank you so much. Stay home, stay, uh, stay safe. And thank you for those who are keeping us safe. Thank you. Dr. Gamila. Thank you, Haitham. Dr. Gamila, can you unmute? اه ميوت اه دكتور هيثم محاضرة جميلة جدا يعني حقيقة انا يعني استفدنا منها كلنا بس انا عايز اسألك سؤال في الايكولاب يعني شايف ان هو العيان ان ان ازاي نحمي نفسنا برضه يعني وات ليفل في الايكولاب ليفل ليفل 3 بروتكشن طيب لو انا عايزة هقول لك يعني نلخص من حضرتك فانت لو جيت تقول لي في العيادة هيبقى ايه وفي الاسطره ايه وفي الايكو يعني في في كلمتين بساط جدا باللغه العربيه للابناء الاعزاء قول لي يعني ملخص بسيط جدا اوت بيشنت كلينك برضه وي جات اوت بيشنت كلينك وي جات ا كويستشن اه اوت بيشنت كلينك از وي سيد ذير از ناو ات اور سيتويشن So we are dealing with another, either a level two protection or a level three protection. What's the difference between them? It's the degree of coverage. It's advisable in the outpatient clinic that any healthcare professional should have a face shield or a, a goggle. A face shield will be more convenient, an N95 mask or a, a mask equivalent, and a long sleeve gown in the uh, uh, outpatient clinic. Uh, you don't have to put gloves. Stuff. You don't have to put uh, gloves, uh, uh, but you must perform hand hygiene with an alcohol-based rubbing uh, uh, between the patients. Uh, or you can change gloves between every patient, but never ever keep one glove uh, 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 throughout the outpatient clinic. This will increase Uh, the incidence of the infection and do not protect the healthcare profession. This is the outpatient clinic. Inside the cath lab, I do recommend that this uh, uh, will increase to level three protection. Meaning what? Meaning that 
we are uh, having a splash goggle or a face shield, an N95 mask, uh, a cover all with uh, a hood that is covering all uh, uh, the parts, a boot, a plastic boot, and a cover of the boot. Because we don't know when these patients are going to be critical, when we will need uh, resuscitation of the patient or intubation of the patient. So we must be uh, prepared from the start. Um, okay, هل, uh, is there any uh, questions? Uh, Dr. Samih, please. ليا بس وان كومنت امبارح كان معانا الدكتور هاني هاني السيد وقال برضو نفس الكلام اللي بيقوله الدكتور هيثم بس نزود عليه ان المسافه بينك وبين المريض the distance between you and the patient should be يعني as far as possible سواء either you are يعني examining the patient or doing a non invasive procedure like echocardiography uh, you should be behind the patient, a patient lying on his left side, and you are behind the patient. This is better than to face the patient. Um, again, the time during examination should be minimal. I mean, uh, yes. if you are taking examination, making examination or taking history, it should be very focused and very minimal. And similar also the echo. You should do focus echo uh, with, because the time is, is related to the rate of infection. If you see the patient yes. for two minutes, it's not like seeing the patient with for 10 minutes. Uh, this should be that, again taken into consideration. And that's why, sir, that we are uh, we are considering doing a phone call uh, evaluation between the cardiologist and the patient inside the triage first uh, in order to take a brief history and to determine whether this patient is an urgent patient. The cardiology must see him now or this patient should be postponed. And another thing is the concept of telemedicine. This concept must be emphasized. It will decrease the incidence of infection and will save time. Dr. Haysa, I'm just asking you about the workers. I mean, of course, the health care professionals, the doctors and the doctors and other people, but the health care workers who are present in the hospital or present in the hospital, or the hospital, or the hospital, do you see any level of protection? The health care workers inside the outpatient clinic can can have a level level one or level two PPE. He can have a level one PPE because the the contact between him and the patient is minimal, especially if we are designing the outpatient clinic to have a distance between the desk of the worker or the place of the worker and the patient. But inside the echo lab and inside the cat lab, these healthcare uh, uh, workers must have a level three PPE because they are dealing with the dust, the splashes, and the liquids, and these are carrying uh, the most incidence of infection. This is an extremely dangerous materials, so they must uh, be protected with a level three PPE. طب في سؤال في كومنت جاء دلوقتي حالا ان مكتوب ان ايجيبشن كلينيك وي نيد وي هاف تو ميجر بلاد بريشر ات كلينيك ديورينج اكزام سو وي نيد تو ابجريد تو فول بي بي اي ليفل 3 بروتكشن نو ليفل ليفل 3 بي بي اي مين ذات يو ار اكسبكتينج ذات ذيس از ان ايروسول بيزد اور جينيريتينج بروسيجر Level 2 PPE, meaning that you are in close contact with the patient. So in the clinic now, during the pandemic, you must protect yourself with a level 2 PPE, meaning that you are covering your hair. There is a, a, a face shield, an N95 mask, and a long sleeve gown. Yes, you will measure the blood pressure with this equipment now. Level 3 PPE, meaning that you are covering the whole of your body with a single suit, which is the coverall, uh, and with 
the other equipment, of course. So we, you don't need to have a level 3 PPE when measuring the blood pressure, of course. But now it's advisable to have a level 2 PPE when you are inside the uh, outpatient clinic. Uh, okay, is there any other questions? Hey. I think we uh, we will keep the questions for uh, for next morning the uh, dialogue between uh, Dr. Haytham and the uh, uh, the question sheet because we have to shift for this next uh, speaker because we are now running out of time and I uh, will give the uh, thank you very much uh, uh, Haytham and sh thank you very much uh, professor uh, professor Gamila uh, for thank you, uh, creating thank this you so much. Of session. Thank you very much. Thank you but very please much. keep uh, you. with us, Yanni. We will need you for further discussion. And now I'm giving of the course. microphone for Professor Mahfouz. Um, uh, uh, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Uh, yeah, yes, yes, we, we hear, hear you, you. we hear you, sir. Yes, I would like to congratulate Dr. Gariba on an excellent uh, presentation. And it gives me a great pleasure to introduce somebody which I haven't met in person yet, oh, but sound like a great, another great Egyptian, uh, you know, uh, healthcare provider, professor, uh, who is currently in London. And one of the hostels where uh, my good friend, Mangi Yakub, have worked and I have met him, as a matter of fact, many years ago. So it is great. And he has been already introduced by Dr. Sama Shaheen, as well as, as so interested at the time. I just welcome him to talk about this very, very interesting and important topic, which is one uh, ultrasound in COVID 19 patients. It's a very important topic. And uh, as you know, uh, Thank you very much for the kind interview. Do you hear me? Hello? Oh, okay. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction. I'm very honored to be today with you this mm -hmm. evening, uh, Professor Al Shahawi, Professor uh, Gamil, Professor Samah Shaheen, and all my great uh, colleagues. I am going to uh, share with you some uh, information on the use of land sound in COVID-19. Yes, we yes, hear we you. Yes, quite well, uh, we hear you and quite the slides well. are clear. Please go on, go on. My ultimate goal for the talk is to uh, utilize and highlight the role of uh, point of care ultrasound, especially land ultrasound, in the management of patients with uh, respiratory failure caused by, by the novel coronavirus. And especially, I think the main importance of the use of sound is the, our ability to individualize care for patients because as I will show you in the first couple of slides in this webinar that these patients are not the same they are different they have different presentations and different degrees of lung involvement uh, so starting with the one of the theories that was suggested uh, to highlight the etiology of uh, uh, the respiratory failure in COVID-19 is what was called lung vasoplegia, in which that there will be a state of significant ventilation perfusion mismatch caused by an injury and affection of the uh, endothelial cells triggered by the virus leading to a diffusion mismatch and consequently a profound flooding of the alveoli, in other terms vasoplegia, which will lead to increase in the perfusion and on the same time the ventilation will not be significantly compromised. That's why most of these patients present initially, initially to the accident and emergency with very low oxygen saturation but on the other hand they don't have significant reduced uh, 
moving one of the interesting questions highlighted and suggested by uh, um, Luciano Gattino is the classifications into two phenotypes, type L and type H. I, I believe that most of us have heard about these phenotypes. That was at the beginning of the pandemic. We saw that sometimes patients have whether normal compliance or they might have abnormal compliance. And that is the difference between both of them in management. And also it's important to highlight the difference because lung ultrasound can give us ability to detect different allergies in the lungs and to therefore adjust our ability to manage them in an appropriate way and to to go further into the different types before starting our ultrasound part is other interesting studies and papers which were later on developed challenging Catinoni's theory proposing several different phenotypes which is what I believe and many of the practitioners believing now that the disease is not that simple it does not simply classify into two, two, only two phenotypes. Every patient is different and we often see in different grades of clinical severity. And here I think is the key for the use of ultrasound. So in this we'll highlight the importance of the management of these patients and I will go through the basics of performing lung ultrasound at the bedside in general, especially for patients with COVID-19. So as I mentioned here, lung ultrasound uh, could be useful to monitor the progression of the disease by seeing the progression of aeration in the lungs, as we will see together, and also very interestingly and importantly, to guide our ability to wean the patient from the ventilator, not only relying on the clinical parameters and the clinical progress, but also relying on lung ultrasound, especially that we often have limited ability to transfer the patient to the CT scanner because of the infection risk, because because reducing the risk of moving the patient out of the red zone. So ultrasound can be a very useful tool at the bedside. And also it can help monitoring the recruitment of the lungs. So one of the problems that we face in patients with uh, respiratory failure is uh, mainly the collapse of the alveoli and the development of consolidation. Because at the beginning of the disease, you start to see in are replaced by fluid and then the fluid will be transformed into tissue. These are the degrees of loss of creation in the lungs. The beauty of ultrasound is that it enables us to detect this of aeration from air, fluid and tissue. And when we monitor the recruitment of the lungs, we can monitor the movement of aeration in the guide from tissue back to fluid back to air. And before we can assess our ability to monitor bonds to proning, which is one of the positional menus that we use for such patients, intensive care units, for helping clinical decision making. So if we put in the search item at PubMed the word ultrasound, I see an exponential rise in the number of publications on the use of lung ultrasound. And the principle we all aware of the principle ultrasound is not transmitted related tissue, the normal brinkum lung is not visible, the interface between pleura and the lung is what is reflect ultrasound beam and our acoustic window for the putting the probe and the lung is the intercostal space. And we all know the importance of ultrasound and echocardiography in general. It's also very important beside is to ability to reduce infection risk is so starting with the practice side, what equipment do we need this lung ultrasound in these patients? We have our card probe, which we use if we don't have our probes. And I will that if we are going to a sport echo study, the other probes available. But ideally, the gold stand probe lung and lung ultrasound are both the linear probe. And both are the in usage. So the curvilinear probe, I will use it mainly to monitor the of the lungs, looking deeply into the lungs, to monitor aeration, as I told you, I will, as we will see together how to see the air, the fluid, the tissue, but even to look at the superficial part of the lung with the pleura, I have to utilize the high frequency probe, the linear probe, the one we use for the insertion of lines and uh, the vascular procedures. So these are the probes. Now we will move into the difference 
of the each side into zones. So we have a systematic examination protocol. We have zones on the right, six zones on the left. This is one of the simple protocols that I recommend. The zone by horizontal imaginary line running along the nipple line, and we have the anterior line, which is the parasternal line with the axillary line and the posterior axillary line. And therefore, we have two zones anterior, two zones lateral, and two zones posterior. And here, I always recommend not to forget the two posterior zones because this is where the devil hides. The consolidation tends to happen posteriorly, especially in critically ill patients who are often in spinal position. Are the zones, but some people ask me what if it's ventilation difficult to move sitting the patient already fit the the previous slide which are the different zones of the lungs was it clear to everyone dividing the lungs into zones two flat posterior zones and then we move into the location of the probe so we know now what probe we can use and we know the different zones of the lungs. Now we will move to the location of the... I, I, I'm back again, I'm really sorry. I changed my internet connection. I think I have a strange technical issue. Do you all hear me now? Yes, we hear you. Have to go on and we can see the slides also. This is very strange. I hope it doesn't happen again. So I already discussed... Uh, uh, the types of the probes and the different zones of the lungs. Now we move to the next step, which is putting the probe in the location which enable me to get the diagnosis. And the location of the probe depends on what we are looking for. If we are looking for pneumothorax, we put the probe in the non-dependent position as you see in the image at the top. So the probe here will be the linear probe, the high frequency probe, because diagnosing pneumothorax will be by the uh, linear probe, by looking at the pleura. And this is out of the context of the webinar because we will not often look for this in COVID-19. But when we look for aeration, ARDS, or heart failure, then we will look at the lung pairing evidence of alveolar and interstitial edema. We put the probe in the dependent zones of the lungs. And if we look for pleural infusion, like the image at the bottom here, we put the probe in the middle axillary line with the indicator to the head of the patient. So the first thing we look for is what is normal. So we said that the lung ultrasound is able to detect different aspects of the lungs. So this is the first normal sign that we need to look for. First of all, to rule out interstitial edema, and it is called the bad sign. So what is the bad sign? If I put my uh, linear probe, which is the high frequency probe, in the mid clavicular line, like the first image that we saw in the previous slide, with the indicator to the patient head, you will see on both sides of the screen these black shadows, which are the rib shadows. And in the middle, you will see the pleura at the top. See the pleural sliding, which confirm the absence of pneumothorax. If you have pneumothorax, you will lose the sliding. And the very important thing to assess for aeration is to look for these mirror shape artifacts of the pleural line. This is very and why this is important? Because when we look at patients with COVID-19, we often look for areas of reduction and loss of aeration in which the A-lines pattern, horizontal A-lines, will be replaced by different other patterns, whether it will be vertical pattern of B-lines or another pattern of consolidation, as we will see together. So this is the first thing, which is the A-lines. And if you look at uh, the top of the screen here, this has been described to be similar to the bat. And this is one of the findings uh, or the signs described by Daniel Lichtenstein. And it is made essential to start with, to make sure that we are, we are using the rib shadows as a landmark to confirm that this is the pleura. Because if I don't put the probe vertical, if I put the probe horizontal from the beginning and getting the A-lines alone, you might not be able to confirm whether this is the pleura or all these uh, first wall line afterwards and look for your angle. 
These are two examples of uh, plural sliding on both sides. Normal sliding here, which is the shim of the visceral and parietal layers of the pleura together to look at. And when you sliding by 2D, what confirm the presence of sliding is to put an M mode and look for one of the patterns described which is, which is the seashore sign or waves on a sandy beach as also described uh, several years ago. And it exemplifies or it tells us that the waves are represented by the chest wall and the breakers is representing the pleura which is the very hyper white line here and the very important sign in this emote picture here is this heterogeneous sandy like texture which confirmed that the ultrasound beam has reached the lung tissue so if you have pneumothorax you lose this pattern completely and you don't see the uh, sand and this will all replaced by mirror shape artifact of the chest wall and it's so back to the aeration we saw initially an example of the a-line this is a, a bigger example of the a-lines in which we see the mirror shaped reverberation artifact of the line this is very important because this is a normal finding so normally, a normal individual with no lung or heart problem, you see a lines as the pattern of normal aeration, all right? But you have to put in mind that we can see a lines in pneumothorax as well, but this is out of our scope. Uh, uh, we mentioned sliding uh, before, and we said that sliding is very important to rule out pneumothorax. This is an example of loss of sliding. So we have a different patient where you don't see the shimmering motion of the pleura and there are different examples of the loss of lung sliding. Not only in thorax, anything that affects the ventilation of the lungs due to, for example, right-sided mental intubation in which the left side is not ventilated, cardiac, cardiac arrest, massive atelectasis, anything that loses the ventilation of the lungs will cause loss of the lung sliding. And this is the pattern I told you about, pneumothorax, in which we lose the ability to see the sand or the heterogeneous pattern of the parenchyma. In, instead, we see this mirror shape of the chest wall, and this is the scopacy or barcode sign. This is one of the signs of the loss of sliding, which can be happening in pneumothorax. So we started with a line. And again, I am getting you back to the COVID-19. Two lines means aeration. So what happens when we start to lose aeration in the lungs? This is our tool to monitor the aeration. When the air in the lungs, in the alveoli, is replaced by fluid, whether the fluid is in the interstitium outside the alveoli or inside the alveoli, you start to see vertical laser-like beams or comet tails. These beams should have specific criteria to be described as B lines. So it should start from the plural line, move to the far end of, this, of the sector. It should be uh, uh, moving with a sliding, as you can see here. And it should also erase the B lines if they are very, very confluent. But in the beginning, you might see both together, depending on the degree of development of the B lines. So normally, you can see in one uh, zone of the lung up to three. That's in the normal individuals. So not single B line will be enough to tell you that this is abnormal. So up to three B lines in number will tell you that there is, this is normal. But when you have more than three B lines, or like this example, you cannot even count them. They are plenty. And when they are plenty like this, they become confluent. And they combine together to make something like a curtain. And the more the number, the whiter the color of the image, as I will show you an example shortly. And this is important because this can tell you the progression of the loss of aeration from interstitial edema to alveolar edema. And in, for, in, in, in the field of intensive care, we describe this as the extra vascular lung water, which is happening in both patients with cardiogenic pulmonary edema and ARDS. So we can see the B lines in both patients.
But there are ways to differentiate. We will discuss it uh, together very shortly. These are another two examples of B lines from different patients. Again, you will see the plural line. You will see the vertical like comet tail starting to the far field. You do not see horizontal lines anymore because the B lines are a lot. But on the left side here, you see a lot of B-lines, but you still see a little bit of A-lines underneath. So the more the B-lines, the less likely you will see the A-lines, which reflects the loss of aeration. So the clinical applications of B-lines are very plenty, not only in COVID-19. In cardiology, they have been integrated in the guidelines for heart failure, for monitoring the diagnosis, therapy titration, risk stratification and prognosis for patients with heart failure and cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And this is an example here. I told you the more the B lines, the more wider you will see the screen. And the B lines will not be individual beams. It will be like like of the B lines and lung aeration to monitor patients with respiratory failure and COVID-19 progression of lung aeration. A lines in the beginning, which is black, horizontal A lines. And then when you start to see black and white with starting evolving vertical like vertical like comet tails which is the intermediate pattern of interstitial edema and then when the a lines disappear b lines become abundant and curtain the, the screen will be white and curtain like moving with ventilation and when you lose the aeration completely and the tissue and the fluid in the alveoli is replaced by tissue like this is what we call consolidation and you start to see it as gray in color on the ultrasound beam this is important. Why? Because it can give you ability to monitor the progression of aeration and also the improvement of the patient during the ITU stay. And these are different no B lines. This is one B line. These are two. And I told you, as I told you before, less than three is normal, and three or more is considered abnormal. So the main question here, and I, and I, I believe this is the one million pound question. Am I able to differentiate cardiogenic pulmonary edema from ARDS with lung ultrasound? The answer is yes. Of course, along with the clinical context, we can have some and looking at the lung parenchyma and try to see differences between them. All the previous images of B lines I have shown you with low frequency transducer. Because remember, we said monitoring the parenchyma and aeration is done by the, curv the curvilinear probe or the phase direction stucer if you don't have the curvilinear probe. But now if you want to look at the pleura in high definition, we have to use the linear probe and here you will see the differences. On the left side, this is non pulmonary edema. You will see very thickened and irregular pleural line, not thin, not healthy, and you will see black hypodensities under the pleural line, which is typical for sub plural consolidation and we have seen this in most of the patients with COVID-19. I got you some examples of real COVID-19 patients and we will see together how they look like. They often have this pattern. Why? Because COVID-19 is a peripheral disease. It predominantly affects the peripheries of the lungs, which is something good for us practitioners of ultrasound, because lung ultrasound has more power at the periphery of the lungs than deeper in the lungs. On the right side here, this is a cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Again, you see B lines, but look at the pleura, very unhealthy. The second thing we look at to differentiate cardiogenic from non-cardiogenic is the distribution of B lines. Distribution, unless we have rare causes of unilateral pulmonary edema, this is a different story. But in ARDS, you often see patchy B lines, patchy and irregular with spared areas in between. Spared areas means areas of A lines, areas of normal aeration between areas of confluent B lines. This is very typical for COVID-19. And we have seen this in many, many of the patients presenting and staying in the intensive care until recovery. Uh, uh, so these are the main differences between both and these are two examples. This is an example of a patient with COVID-19. You have thick irregular pleura. Again, this is the linear probe. I cannot see the pleura with this 
high definition with the cardiac or curvilinear probe or the linear probe and looking at the hypodense shadow interrupting the pleura here. This is subpleural consolidation. And on the other hand, we have the standard low frequency transducer looking at a patient with heart failure, thin pleura and curvy and confluent curtain line. Both is looking at the basis of the lungs for any consolidation. You remember the devil hides posteriorly. So when we look posteriorly for any devil hiding, we can see consolidation or at the Lexus, which is often happening in patients with cardiopulmonary edema, is consolidation. But patients with heart failure usually have uh, pleural infusion uh, whether actually or on the right side, but again, there are always exceptions. Both patients can, or both conditions can coexist together. And this are another example of the use of ultrasound for pleural effusion. So here, effusion, as you all know, is black and the lung tissue is uh, white or gray, lexus from larger pleural effusion. And to get this image, we use the curvilinear probe, the mid axillary line with the indicator to the patient's head and then we show landmark. So the diaphragm on the right side, split left side, and the looking consolidation is the least great degree of uh, ventilation perfusion. This is the patient who was admitted to our center with typical uh, manifestations and COVID-19 and uh, uh, he has been, I have not seen that big subpleural consolidation in other ARDS patients. I've seen this severe degrees mainly in the COVID-19 when they started to come. And uh, this is scanning both lungs, not this on both sides, uh, to the left. And when we change the probe to the curvilinear probe, look at this very bright striking pattern. You see the tiny pattern of this alveolar edema. You have the point pattern of the B lines. And in between, you have the A-lines are still preserved, the black and the mirror shape artifact of the plural. And same on, on this side. You will notice that you will have the uh, this shiny white shadow of the confluent B-lines coming from either normal plural, thin plural, or irregular plural. Some of the authors and uh, a colleague, uh, um, uh, Giovanni Borpicelli described the development of these shiny bright shadows coming from the thin flora as light beam artifacts. And he noticed that this is linked to the acute stage of the disease when patients are presenting in the beginning. So this is very interesting to look into. But again, remember this very striking alveolar edema, as I call it, with black shadows in between, uh, meaning the spared areas of the airlines. And we do a bit, a bit sophistic of sophisticated scoring. It's not very complex, but we uh, we just put the the, the description that I told you between the A lines and lines consolidation of like the problem continues with the voice here what about maybe the take-home message from the whole things can you probably try to summarize that dr. Hatton so, 
what, what do you think uh, about this new technique? Uh, I, I haven't seen it in our hospitals yet. So do you apply it in your uh, in your center? Uh, do you have any experience in uh, in reports even about this uh, technique? Until Dr. Hatim is back. Not because most uh, we talk about uh, fusion and uh, you know uh, pneumothorax and heart and all that really you know, with the current technique you know we have we can very good uh, well that's what I was going to try to ask him if he found any significant difference by applying that is number one number two if he ever correlated that with the biomarker like specifically uh, troponin supposed to be a very good marker biomarker for the COVID-19 and if you talk about heart failure of course BNB and last but not least you know you see really now we are have been in the past concentrating more on the lung but really now the evidence coming out stronger is is really a lot of the problem problem and maybe what you see here in a combination of COVID cardiovascular as well as COVID pulmonary to show the difference between the cardiac and the pulmonary of the slump. Maybe the cardiac is also secondary to COVID. I don't know if you, uh, Dr. Hatim, are you back with us? I don't think we're, it looks like we lost Dr. Hatim. Um, um, I, I uh, think and I have a comment on lung ultrasound. There uh, is uh, a practice for lung ultrasound in Egypt, on the idea. And the practice is growing, you know. ويعني اتعمل في في كارديو ايجيبت اللي فات سيشن كان اميزنج سيشن اللي كان بتنظمه جامعه عين شمس على اللانج الترا ساوند وبرده احنا عندنا في جامعه قناه السويس في رساله دكتوراه كامله اتعملت على اللانج الترا ساوند وهو موجود في الجايد لاينز ومن ضمن الانديكيشنز بتاعته ان هو بتفولو الهارت فيلير بيشنتس و الثيرابي كمان يعني و اتس ا فيري ايزي تكنيك فهو ده uh, يعني uh, ده وان اوف ذا ارياز اللي هي بتتكلم على الفوكس بتاعته او البوكس او اللي هو uh, بيبقى, uh, بيبقى, uh, بيبقى بيبقى بتليد المانجمنت للعيان مش لازم يكون كارديولوجي فهو وبيبقى في الكريتيكال كير ولكن اتس ان ايزي جوب اتعملت رسائل كتيره في مصر عليها من ضمنها اسيوط جامعه قناه السويس عين شمس زي ما قلت لحضرتك كارديو ايجيبت عملت سيشن كنت ليا الشرف ان انا احد رؤسائه يعني على اللانج الترسونت جميل جميل فانا اي ثينك ان الكومينج دايز هتشهد انه كومبانيون مهمه قوي لدكاتره القلب طبعا طبعا اكشولي اف اي مي اد A comment, please. Ah, uh, Dr. Haysen, Fadda. Actually, lung ultrasound is now one of the uh, screening tools for patients with the COVID affection in the position paper of the European Society. And they are stating uh, that if the lung ultrasound is not available, we can do a CT scan. So lung ultrasound is now the first tool after the, the initial uh, physical examination of a patient suspected with COVID in the European Society uh, paper, position paper. Definitely. So I think this yeah. technique is taking uh, more interest. Uh, it's re- reproducible. Uh, it can be performed easily and quickly and safely without any concerns of radiation hazards for the patients. Yes, I agree. Dr. Hatem, uh, I believe you are now With us, are you back with I am, us? I am back. I, I'm really, I'm really sorry. This is very strange. It never happened with me. I, I hope it remains well until the end. I, I hope that the sequence of the presentation was clear despite the interruptions. It, was it clear to everyone? Uh, do I need to repeat anything that I missed in the middle or uh, so far? Uh, 
No, we, we, we did ask some questions. I think uh, Professor Mahfouz, uh, if you have time for five minutes to, to answer some of the questions, uh, I, I think uh, this is a very important technique uh, and uh, it seems like uh, uh, we are now having a new uh, technique to our uh, diagnostic tools. Uh, so, yes. Professor Mah Mahfouz, would you like to repeat the question for Professor uh, to, uh, Hatem? Yeah, but, uh, first uh, we talk about, we have been uh, concentrating till now mostly on the pulmonary, but recently uh, coming more and more cardiac might be the primary culprit here to many of this problem, we're seeing that. Now, have you correlated between the cardiogenic as well as the pulmonary that might be the picture really secondary to COVID of the heart too, rather than just um, a, a different one. Second, have you correlated this technique with the biomarker and you showed significant improvement in the biomarker specifically, the troponin and BNB, which have been very, very much troponin have been being invoked as one of the most sensitive America in COVID-19. Yes. Uh, these are very important questions, uh, Professor al uh, Honestly, this is a very evolving technique. So there are very few correlations uh, globally on this technique. Uh, so if we talk about evidence, the evidence is not there yet. We all have, what we have is clinical and experience based. The studies are now evolving and we are running a study and many other colleagues and uh, lung ultrasound practitioners are running it, but I am not aware of any correlation, validated correlation between cardiac biomarkers, as you uh, mentioned, and between the utilization of ultrasound in patients with COVID-19. I hope that more data will be available in the future, uh, but as highlighted by you, uh, this is a new field. And I think that we will get more validation in the future, like any new modality. It takes time to get robust evidence. But as a practitioner, I can tell you, it is extremely useful at the bedside for clinical use. Um, but the, the data are lacking, unfortunately. We have several questions. The truth is interesting. For you too, from the attendees. There is Dr. Amr Mansour. كاتب ثلاث أسئلة لكن هي كاتب بيس بيتساءل على البي لاينز are not specific is it right؟ yes وقال إن البي لاينز are present in congestion and in infection they are not so they are not specific that's that's true وكاتب إن إحنا so we evaluate each zone twice by two probe probes to assess the parenchyma and pleura فإجابة حضرتك إيه فت so uh, uh, the scanning the parenchyma, we use the, score, the, the, zone, the zoning system that we mentioned, Lahoma said six zones on the right, six on the left. But the scanning the pleura, the best way is to scan each intercostal space. If we need to get a, an accurate representation of what is going on. We know that the main comparison, the main radiological tool is the CT. Lung ultrasound will never replace CT and it, it is less accurate than CT. But if we want to get an information which is close to the information we get from CT, we have to scan each intercostal space when we scan the pleura by the linear probe. But the, 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 the protocol for scanning the parenchyma is often enough by six zones on the right, six zones on the left, with the use of the curvilinear or phased array transducer. Benesbel Suel El specificity. Taban el B lines are not specific for COVID at all. With them, old el B lines but missing the presence of interstitial or alveolar edema. Will it name be hasalo fil ARDS or be hasalo fil cardiogenic pulmonary edema? The comparison that I have made, I hope the disconnection that I have caused you and you have seen on the screen, is that there are tools, there are tips that we can use to differentiate between both. The heart failure, the pure heart failure, the pleural line will be thin and healthy. I don't see the sub-pleural consolidations. I always see it in people who have pneumonia and ARDS. The B-lines that are present in the heart failure will be symmetrical 
وبايلاترال لكن في الـ ARDS والنون كادوجينيك بالمونري ديما اسبيشالي في الكوفيد بتبقى باتشي واسيماتريكال ده ردي على السؤال يا يعني ريت يكون ده كلام طيب حضرتك الدكتور محمد حاتم برضو ادى سؤالين كان الترا ساوند تشست ريبليس السي تي تشست وسؤال تاني كان الترا ساوند تشست تيل اس ذا بروجنوزيس اوف كوفيد 19 السؤال الاول الاجابه لا طبعا اللانج اوتر ساوند ات از نوت مينت تو ريبليس سي تي سي تي از ذا جولد ستاندرد راديولوجيكال تول فور بيشنتس ويز any respiratory problem. But the problem we have is CT is not a portable technology. Number two, CT is expensive. Number three, CT is not safe. We have a lot of radiation. So ultrasound is a complementary tool. In we saw the importance of lung ultrasound when the pandemic I have been doing the lung ultrasound for several years. For any patient coming to me in the intensive care, but بالذات لما حصلت the pandemic, لقينا إن the ultrasound مهمة جدا عشان العيان ما يتنقلش لل CT scan, نمنع أو نقلل من عدد the healthcare professionals exposed لل patient لو راح the radiology كذا واحد حيتعرض له عندنا the ICU divided into red zone. اللي فيها الكوفيد بيشنتس مش عايزين ننقل البيشنت من بره ريد زون فبقى عندنا الترا ساوند ماشين ديديكيتد للبيشنتس وبقى عندنا بروتوكول فور سكانينج افري بيشنت ويز كوفيد 19 وبقى الالترا ساوند بالنسبه لنا از ا مونيتور تو اسس ذا ديفلوبمنت اوف ذا ديزيز وي بروجريشن وزي ما قلت ات كود ات واز ايبل تو هيلب اس الونج ويز ذا كلينيكال بيكتشر ذا ابيليتي تو وين ذا بيشنت اند ميكينج فيرذر ديسيجنز Dr. Gamil, please uh, say that out about the prognosis. Actually, the troponin have been already recently. Yes, yes, sir. Much better as a very prognostic from the deterioration point of view and from the improvement point of view. I don't know if you have been using it in Egypt at any time. Have you? Yes, uh, I think it is used in Egypt, troponin. No, uh, as far as the COVID, I'm talking about as far as the COVID patients. Uh, I think in in في بعض المستشفيات العزل بيستخدم أعتقد ذلك إنه one of the parameters important parameters for patients for screening. So I think it is it is considered an important uh, tool. للكوفيد بيشنتس في مصر برضه في مستشفيات العزل. آه في سؤالين تانيين برضه اتفضل يا فندم. So whether then maybe just the troponin value will be as good and easy to do than the pulmonary ultrasound. Any correlation or any idea? I think ان البلمونري ultrasound is not او اللونج ultrasound is not used في الـ الـ يعني as a usual practice in Egypt يعني لكن هو في دراسات كتيرة معمولة عليه و I think ان الـ الـ available في بعض مستشفيات العزل الـ echocardiography in many hospitals يعني لكن regarding the lung ultrasound I think it is not يعني uh, يعني everyday practice Still yet no, no. I think so. I'm not sure of that. Like, I think it is not everyday practice. Yeah. في سؤال تاني دكتور حاتم الدكتور خالد كمال بيقول can we can you can we have a brief highlighted findings in patients suspected with COVID-19? Would like to sound Dr. Kamila. Ah yes, sir. Yes, Dr. Hatem. Yes, definitely. In the real, and the محاضرتك very interesting, بصراحة. طبعا يا فندم. يعني. The lung ultrasound. في في طبعا pattern. إحنا قدرنا نشوفه. بس the pattern ده مش specific بس في the COVID-19. هو it was described for ARDS in general. Patients with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. اللي هو thickened irregular. Um, uh, plural line with subplural consolidation, as we saw with each other, with patchy alveolar edema. But in COVID, the pattern of the patchy alveolar edema 
يعني يمكن حتى في السلايد انا اي ويل جو باكورد في السلايد اللي فاتت ده الباترن ما كناش بنشوفه بال بالسترايكنج ابييرنس ده في العيانين بتوع الاي ار دي اس اللي هو اللايت بيم اللي بنلاقيه طالع من ثين بلورا او حتى فيري برايت بيم كومينج اوت اوف ثين ثيك ريجولار بلورا انا اغلب البيشنتس الكوفيد اللي شفتهم وزملاتنا اللي بابلشت ذير اكسبيرينس ان ايطالي وسبين وفرانس وتشاينا they all described this the patients of covid or respiratory failure due to covid ma andhomsh a typical rds so you don't see the consolidation of rds uh, i used to deal with patients on venovenous ecmo gayim h1n1 influenza and i used to see them coming من غير البيكتشر دي خالص i used to see them coming with fulminant consolidation in all the lungs in all the lungs but they don't like that the moderate degree of loss of aeration in which we see patchy B lines زي كده ما بنلاقيش consolidations كتير it is very uncommon to see lower consolidation في ال COVID-19 unless they have a secondary bacterial infection or unless they have the fulminant type اللي هو ال extreme form of disease which is not common the commonest is this pattern ده تمام جدا اخر سؤال لحضرتك من سمون من الاتنديز هاو كان اي ديفرنشيت بين لونج كونتيوجن اند نيمونيا يوزنج الترا ساوند والله الحقيقه ما يعني ما, ما فيش سنجل ساين تو اول الفرق بين لونج كونتيوجن اند كونسوليديشن لو لو ده سؤال ات ويل بي فيري ديفيكولت وده يمكن يجيبني النقطه مهمه بروفيسور جميله ان The lung ultrasound is only one of the tools that we should use. Yeah. We have to always use it in the clinical context. And I always say to my colleagues and all the people in my teaching, the echo and ultrasound is not something that we follow blindly. We have to have an integrated approach to use all the tools we have. Now, one of the findings contradict the clinical picture with clinical scenario, I don't follow it. So I consider all the tools together. I agree. Uh, for this is my message but uh, there is no clear differentiation between contusion and consolidation on lung ultrasound. Alha Dr. Hatem I enjoyed very much your presentation. Thank well, you. Very elegant with steps step by step يعني الحقيقه يعني very interesting. فانا لو دكتور سامح يوافقني لو حضرتك بروفايد اس with يعني بعض lectures على اللنج الترا ساوند حضرتك تسجلها لنا باوديو باوربوينت ونعمل لها تبقى افيلبل لكل الدكاتره عندنا في مصر يبقى يعني فيري كاند يشرفني طبعا يشرفني طبعا انا شيء يسعدني ويشرفني انا بحب اللنج الترا ساوند واي تيتش ات واي اي لاف ايفري وان تو بي دوينج ات لان انا شايف الفائده بتاعته والبنفيت منه فتحت عمركم ودي فيوتشر الحقيقه اي ثينك ذيس از ذا كامينج فيوتشر ودي مهمه قوي يبقى يبقى نشكر حضرتك جدا لو حضرتك عملت لنا سلسله محاضرات يعني فروم اي تو زد هاو شود اي براكتس ذا تكنيك وازاي وايه التولز اللي انا عايزاه عايزها معايا والانديكيشنز يعني ات ويل بي فيري كايند اوف يو ونحطها على الاديوكيشنال شانل بتاعت جمعيه القلب المصريه يبقى فيري كايند يشرفني و اي ويل فولو ات ان شاء الله واعمل لكم كل حاجه باذن الله وشرف لي نشكر حضرتك جدا يا فندم والله اقتراح رائع يا دكتور جميله وبنحيي كل طبعا اللي اشتركوا معانا في ذيس ويبينار اولهم طبعا استاذ دكتور محفوظ الشهاوي بنشكرك دكتور محفوظ فور انريتشنج ذيس ديسكشن بروفيسور جميله نصر ثانك يو فيري ماتش فور ذيس يعني فيري نايس ديسكشن احنا اللي بنشكر حضرتك لان حضرتك صاحب الفكره يا فندم وبنشكر طبعا اخونا العزيز دكتور هيثم شكرا حضرتك جدا ثانك يو فيري ماتش شكرا شكرا ثانك يو ثانك يو فيري ماتش يا دكتور سامح وبنشكر الدكتور حاتم سليمان على وعد ان شاء الله ان احنا شكرا لحضرتك ونعمل يعني انا لا ات هابنز طبعا وده بيوري ان ان احنا بعد الكوفيد 19 يستحسن ان احنا نرجع الفيس تو فيس كونفرنسز مش هت يعني الويبينارز ويل نيفر يعني جو فروم ذا فيس تو فيس ميتينجز كل سنه وانتم طيبين ونشوفكم على خير ان شاء الله كل سنه وحضرتك طيب يا فندم كل سنه وحضرتك طيب الخميس اللي جاي معانا زميلنا الدكتور محمد عبد الوهاب من المانيا اي ثينك عن السي تي وده برضو مهم ان كوفيد 19
بليز ستي تيوند وصباح الخير شكرا جزيلا شكرا 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 I would like to add thanks for the Mercury of Ragib and Liz for supporting this program keep the good work keep the support thank you very much thank you thank you Mercury thank, thank you very much thank you thank you very much I'm Ed. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.